Thank you for tuning in and welcome back to the Sandwich of Coherency. So, over the past couple days, we've been getting into getting to know the guy in charge. So we're going to continue down that path and just, because there's so many interesting things and connections in 47 years and the company that they keep. So let's go ahead and look a little bit into what we've got. And we'll also throw in just a little bit of interesting things about these mandates and such that they want to put you under. So let's start with a quote from George Orwell from 1984. Power is not a means, it is an end. One does not establish a dictatorship in order to safeguard a revolution. One makes the revolution in order to establish the dictatorship. And it seems to be that the current administration, that is what they've done. Now, recently, Jen Psaki, the press secretary, just a little tidbit about that. The dealings with Hunter Biden in Burisma, you know, it's kind of ironic that that was up in debate and there were questions about that whilst Joe Biden was vice president and Jen Psaki just happened to be press secretary for the State Department at the time even stating that well it's not a big deal the government's not worried about it he's a private citizen well looks like they probably should have worried about it but let's get back on track so recently she was stating that the major holdups that seem to be happening in the administration is the fact that the Republicans are holding up the confirmations of his nominees. Now, I've talked about a couple of these nominees, and, and you have to, when you find out who they are and what they're, what they have been about, you would have reservations about them as well. You have the one that was chosen for the Bureau of Land Management, who is an eco-terrorist. I mean, you've got Miss Co, the Honorable Judge, that decided it would be a good policy in California to prevent church services or people getting together in the home but it was completely okay to open strip clubs you've got Biden's choice for the Massachusetts top prosecutor and when you find out what they're about you would have reservations as well She was very adamant in disavowing what the state legislature had put forth and voted on and decided that things that she will not allow to be prosecuted were things such as trespassing, shoplifting, larceny. She believed driving with a suspended license is not a crime. Which means if you get busted for driving under the influence it really doesn't matter does it because if you get busted again with that suspended license it's not a crime you will be sent on your way she also believes that breaking and entering into a non-vacant property not just a vacant property to escape the weather elements is not a crime and will not be prosecuted. Now, granted, nobody should be out in the cold, but I'll be damned if in the middle of the night you're just gonna break into my house amongst my family and I and think you're just gonna crash over. She doesn't believe wanton and malicious destruction of property is a crime. So, these are just a few of his 
nominations. And once you become aware of whom these people are, how could you question why anybody would hesitate in confirming them? You've got his Justice Department nominee, Gupta, which is very adamant about abolishing police. You've got Kristen Clark, whom is also adamant about abolishing the police. And these are the people that they want to put in charge of attempting to protect you. So, keeping in that vein, let's just have a look at a few bits of, well, let's just have a look at the president. Let's just look at some of the things that we know about the current president that people may have missed over, aside from the fact that he was vice president during one of the worst economic growth periods since the Great Depression. At a time when 14 million Americans left the workforce. 800,000 fell into poverty by 2016. So, we're looking at that and it's just, I, 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 I don't understand how people were so blindsided by the fact that this is what was being put forth. The media did an amazing job of covering and lying. It's let's just have a look at the Hunter Biden laptop fiasco. The computer shop owner was smart enough to back up the hard drive. So when he gave it to the just because when he gave it to the FBI, the FBI sat on it and said it was a nothing burger. And then they decided when they did release it, the media decided they weren't going to say anything about it because they adamantly admitted, well, they didn't want that to hinder the current president's chances of being elected. And so they opted out of informing the public about that until after the election. You've got the Democrats telling you, oh, this is a Russian plot. This is a, a plot from the Russians to, to keep Joe Biden from being president. And now they admit, yes, this is something we, well, it was never Russian, but we, and we should look into it now. You have to be wary of these people. You cannot idolize these people. They will bring you down. They are not looking out for your best interest. Let's look back at what happened with Libya. With all the screaming of Black Lives Matter and racism and bringing up lack of equality and such, even though living in the United States, you have the easiest opportunity in life that you could really ever ask for. Hence the idea why the United States takes in 50% of all immigrants total of the global migration. So remember, Joe Biden was the vice president in that fiasco. Part of him, he part of that assassination of Gaddafi which ramped up a Saudi Arabian slave trade of migrant Africans nobody likes to talk about that and that seems to be something that everybody wants to avoid but let's just call it out there is a current slave trade of migrant Africans in Libya due to the vacuum that was caused by the Obama Biden administration assassination of Gaddafi. 
and it's only gotten worse, and they haven't done shit about it, and they don't want to talk about it. The U.S., they backed mercenaries. So, and they were called, black Libyans were commonly branded as foreign mercenaries. Now, what happened was, the Tawerga, which is an entire town of 30,000 black and dark skinned Libyans, vanished by August 2011. After it was taken over by the NATO backed NTC Mizratin Brigades. Let's think about that. 30,000 people. What do you think happened to them? Think they peacefully left? I doubt that one. I think, I mean, let's just, we'll just go ahead and not say it, but we know. Now, the saying goes, today's terrorist is tomorrow's rebel. And vice versa. The group that was backed by NATO in the US were the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which was affiliated with Al Qaeda. I mean, we backed them because. They were against Gaddafi. See, you have to remember in one country, ISIS is your enemy, Al Qaeda is your enemy, the Taliban is your enemy, but depending on a different country that they might be in, well, they're your allies, and they're just fighting for their freedom, so we have to arm them. Because the difference between friend or foe is just based on what country that you're in at the time. <laughs> you gotta remember the Obama administration gave its blessing and shipped weapons to the rebels in Libya. So, this is what has led me to bring up these things because the guy in office shares his and when he shares his share of the blood you're talking about a guy this is your current president who blocked all the attempts that the United States made to set human rights standards for dealing with China for these intense trading measures So, he shares a part of the guilt as to why the human violations that keep going on over there continue and we still keep doing business and companies are not punished for using the labor. But everybody wants to keep everything cheap. We want to keep everything cheap. God forbid that $1,500 iPhone made in the United States should only still be $1,500. But if they had to pay Americans to do it, paying American wages, well, the price of that might increase by a few grand and might constitute itself as a new payment or rather a down payment on a new car. So, now, let's have a look at the company that they keep in. Let's, let's look at those that we call to be the leaders 
and let's start with Elijah Cummings, the representative from Baltimore, Maryland. And let's just listen to what he has to say about the district that he decided to move out of. Because let's keep in mind, Maryland is a Democratic stronghold and has been for over a hundred years. I, I want I want that to sink in. Maryland has been Democrat for over a hundred years. When you hear the problems about Baltimore, they can try and blame all the outside people that they want, but that is their problem that they created. Now the same problems that, or rather the problems that Baltimore is faced with, that Maryland as a whole is faced with now, let's have a listen to Elijah Cummings in 1999. This morning, I left my community of Baltimore, a drug infested area, where a lot of the drugs that we're talking about today have already taken the lives of so many children. The same children that I watched 14 or 15 years ago as they grew up, now walking around like zombies. This is only 40 miles away from here. That was in 1999, and I believe it was, what, 2019, early 2020, when you had groups going out attempting to help clean the area up, and there were attempts made by the people that consider themselves the leaders of the city to stop them from removing tons of garbage from the streets. All the citizens were happy, especially the older citizens. They were quite happy to see that because the leaders of their city neglected them and hadn't done shit for them, but they keep promising, oh, we're gonna, we're gonna clean it up. We're gonna fix it one of the last mayors Carolyn Pugh whom was sentenced to three years in prison and three years of probation for fraud by selling her children's book to non-profits in order to uh, get that tax-free money to raise for her mayoral campaign and she had been doing this for years so God knows what else she did in that little time she was the mayor from 2016 but let's just have a listen to the mayor And I, I have to tell you, this is this is just absolutely hilarious. This is this is Mayor Pugh from Baltimore in 2018. So let's have a listen to this report. About a year ago, city leaders identified some of the city's most violent neighborhoods. What the hell? We should just take all this down. To target who needs to smell rats. Under Baltimore's Violence Reduction Initiative. Oh, Jesus. Just last week, we went with Mayor Pugh as she toured an East Baltimore neighborhood. This a new one. I've been out here 54 years. This a new one. Baltimore's Violence Reduction Initiative is about taking steps to rid communities of the cornerstones that contribute to crime. Oh, my God. You can smell the dead animals. Blocks of dilapidated. Oh. I know I probably shouldn't laugh, but the, I'm sorry, that's fucking, that's just hilarious. <laughs> that's hilarious, their first response is, we just tear all this shit down. <laughs> now, now look, that is 
from 2018. That's almost 20 years since Eliza Cummings was basically calling it a shithole. And it hasn't gotten any better, and they've been in charge the entire time. Please tell me, why do you keep putting these people back in office year after year? I mean, lunacy is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm baffled. I'm baffled. And so, to end this out, we're going to talk about something very important. And I want to talk about these health issues, these, what you call them, um, adverse reactions, and just good overall idea to give you a good, a good idea, just a good thought process to hold on to when listening to what they're attempting to tell you, more or less when they lie to you. Because, as far as I'm concerned, at this point, it, it's a hit or miss with whether or not you're going to get any truth out of these people. So, what I want to start with is giving an idea of a report. This was reported in the Atlantic. Now, this is from March 2019. When it's important that you know this, in the growing 161,000 plus homeless population throughout Los Angeles and California, um, a few things have emerged. You've got tuberculosis. You've got typhus. Now, you've also got Shigella and Bartonella. So, now that's also being found in Washington State. But, um, let me, let me give you an idea of what we're talking about here. Uh, Shigella is bacteria that is spread through feces. It's the Bartonella, uh, spread through lice. So, we've got Hepatitis A breaking out in heavy numbers. You know... And as they like to put it, typhus is a medieval disease. In California in 2019. In the United States, there are about half a million people that were homeless at the end of 2018, with the numbers they give, and about 25% of them are in California. So, with all their ideologues of them fixing things, I, I give, trying to consider themselves a beacon that the rest of the nation should look to like they are so fucking advanced and so far ahead of everybody, why not clean up the streets? Hey, maybe you should do something about the hepatitis and the typhus outbreaks. You can't boast yourself as this forward-thinking place and you have a quarter of the United States homeless people living on the street. What are you doing with the fucking money? Somebody needs to check the books. Now, what I will close off with tonight is I want to tell you and I want to thank Young Ripper 59 for this one CFR what's well 29 CFR part 1904 recording and reporting occupational injuries and illnesses 
And if you go to the OSHA website, and if you were to go to the coronavirus, frequently asked questions, and you go down to the bottom and you look up vaccine related, and it asks, are adverse reactions to the COVID-19 vaccine recordable on the OSHA record keeping log? And DOL and OSHA, as well as other federal agencies, are working diligently to encourage COVID-19 vaccinations. Listen carefully. OSHA does not wish to have any appearance of discouraging workers from receiving the COVID-19 vaccination and also does not wish to disincentivize employers' vaccination efforts. As a result, OSHA will not enforce 29 CFR 1904's recording requirements to require employers to record worker side effects from the vaccination, at least until May of 2022. So what they are telling you to your face right now is they will not be recording any adverse reactions to the COVID-19 vaccination and they are not wanting employers to do it because if that information gets out, people will not want, people will hesitate. Understand that they are saying we are going to hide the truth and information from you to get the desired results that we want. And with that, if you continue to run into it blindly, And just want to believe them because they're playing off your fear in hopes that you won't ask questions. Go ahead if that's what you want to do. But by all means, don't force that on the rest of everybody else. Think for yourself. And despite what they might want you to believe or what they try and tell you, do your own research. That's all I ask is do your own research. And I thank you for tuning in and I hope you have a wonderful night.